Good morning, everybody. I'm sure you probably, we don't have all the mics and everything set up the way we normally do, and that's because Mike forgot the cord. Uh, this is what happens when you get a grandson hitting you with a hockey stick as you're packing up and trying to print bulletins last night. He was poking me like Grandpa because he wanted to watch this uh, Christmas movie. Uh, and so I completely blew it. And uh, so as... As I would say, I wouldn't take me to Vegas right now, that's for sure, because I do not, I've, you know, it's been a morning and all. So the other thing is, you probably notice that Miss Teresa's not here, and, uh, and she's, you know, under the weather, and so we didn't want to have her come and ruin y'all's Thanksgivings. And so we were like, let's, let's just go ahead, and she was up at 4 o'clock in the morning just draining. And I think that's the cold that's been going around anyway through San Antonio. It's not COVID, so just, you know, FYI. Um, I know they call everything that, but it's not that. Um, and so we just, she was asleep. The poor thing was asleep on the uh, recliner this morning when I got up. And I was like, and she was dressed for church. But I was like, sweetheart, you need to just stay here and, and rest. So I'm missing my rib. And I felt it this morning. Uh, what I mean by that is when you have your wife who's, who's your, uh, you know, right on your side and we're, do, we do everything together, you, you miss that. And so, God bless you, baby. I love you. Hopefully you can hear all this. We don't even know if this is working. So you may just hear me just pantomime at this point. Uh, this week we'll be in Mark chapter 8, and we're going to cover 21 verses today. So we'll be in Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 21. If you want to turn to your Bibles or turn on your Bibles and get them ready. Um, and then, uh, just two quick announcements. Uh, the Wednesday service, everybody, uh, there'll be no service on Wednesday for uh, Thanksgiving. It's to give everybody a time of rest, uh, you know, especially those that do sound court. And, and Miss Elvis filling in for a children's ministry for Teresa, which was a blessing. Um, and so, uh, you know, it just gives everybody kind of a chance to be with family. And I'll have them, uh, uh, because I used to, I would be like, why are we not doing church? Because I need a church. And so, but I'll have a message that'll go up uh, on Wednesday that'll be, uh, be there for you if, you, if that's you. Uh, you need to hear a message that'll be up there. So I'll make sure it gets posted and, and it'll be there. Uh, but there, there'll be nobody here and all. So if you come, you'll be here by yourself. So, um, and then the, the Calvary Chapel Association, the conference for Texas, Oklahoma, the dates are there for March 3rd and 5th, and then the costs are there. Uh, if you pay early, you save money. And, and so they haven't opened registration up yet. I'll let y'all know as soon as registration opens up, it's open to everyone. It used to be for pastors and leaders, but this year they decided to let's open it up for everybody. Um, Pastor Sandy Adams from uh, Calvary Chapel Stone Mountain is gonna be teaching. There's a lot of great teachers coming in for the conference. Um, and then they have the cost for the kids on there as well. Uh, so y'all can just kind of have that in your mind because if, you're, if you work with a budget or you work on a limited budget, you want to save for the conference and that's what it's for. So that way, if you one, you need to take time off of work and two, if you need to set some money aside so you can go to the, the conference and all. So that's, that's something that, you know, it's, it's in Houston. It's a wonderful wonderful place and great time of fellowship and and so we hope that y'all come along because i know me and Teresa will be going and uh you know it's it's just a great time of fellowship great time to uh to hang out with each other and you know, now i'm thinking court we got <laughs> we don't need that now see that's been that kind of a day uh tithes and offerings the the tide box is in the back it's between you and the lord and then also, if you want to do it, you can go to calvarydivine.org. If you want to go ahead and because we have that mic on right now, I'm not going to have you stand because it'll hear everything. So if you want to go ahead and turn on, uh, go ahead and turn your, to your Bibles in, in your Bible to Mark chapter 8 or turn them on. I know some of y'all have them on your phone. Uh, let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 21 as we get started. In those days when again a great crowd had gathered, they had nothing to eat. He called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the, on the way. 
and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed them, directed the crowd to sit down on the, on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set uh, them before the crowd, and they had a few small fish. And having, a bless, having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and he ate, and he sent them away, and immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanatha. Let me say that right, because I have it written down here so I would get it right. Dalmanatha, that's how it is. Uh, and, and the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven and the, of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the, fi uh, for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did I take up? And they said to him, Twelve. And the seven uh, for the uh, and the seven for the four thousand. How many baskets full of broken pieces did I take up? And they said to him seven. And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We do pray as uh, you know all these little things of technology don't work. That's not important. Uh, the thing that's important is that we're here for your word. Uh, we're we're coming into your presence, Lord, and wanting to hear from you. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to each heart. Um, let us not only have understanding, but that we would have uh, application, uh, that we would actually put, put it to work, Lord. We do pray, Lord, and, and we just ask uh, that you just continue to bless this church and uh, bless the, the work that you're doing in it. We pray for the children's ministry, that they would be ready to learn the word this morning as well. And uh, we thank you for all that you're doing. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I entitled this in, in Mark chapter 1, uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 21. Do you not yet understand? Very simply, the same thing that Jesus asked twice, right? The same thing Jesus asked twice. And, and, I, and, and we'll look at it in three parts. We'll look at the understanding the needs of the crowd. Uh, in verses 1 through 10, and then understanding the challenge of the religious in verses 11 through 13, and then understanding it wasn't about bread in verses 14 through 21. So one of the things that we're going to learn in this, and this is a very familiar story, you automatically probably thought, is this the same story as the 5,000? It's not. It's a different story, and we'll talk about that, because people who try to challenge the Word of God or try to challenge the Bible will use these verses to say that they're just repeating the same story over. And I'm going to show you the differences between the, the, the story of the 5,000, the feeding of the 5,000, and the feeding of the 4,000. The thing is, is this story is actually recorded in the book of Matthew and the book of Mark. It's, it's been put in both books, and, uh, and we'll look at the differences in, in those as far as the, uh, some of the more information that Matthew covers. The thing that I want you to get from this is even though this story is another miracle that Jesus is doing, this should have been familiar to the disciples. There should be some kind of spiritual muscle memory, right? Or exercise that they should have known. Not religion, but relationship. That's the same thing for us. You know, if you think about somebody who 
who pitches for a living for baseball. They throw the same way over and over and over. Now, I remember Joe. Joe can shoot a three-pointer. I can't do that. I mean, he has a sweet release and everything, and he told me it's muscle memory. It's from doing it over and over, and it's a certain release to release the basketball to get that shot. It was a lot of shooting to get that shot. And for us, that's the same thing for us. It's like we need to understand for us, our spiritual muscle memory, the things that we should be working on is the Word of God, prayer, fellowship. You know, these things are things that we should, they should be natural to us. Now, there are going to be things that we do in ministry that can become routine, and we need to be careful with that. Because when we forget to, to have the power of the Holy Spirit involved in it, it can be a dangerous thing. And, and so that's why, like here in the church, I, I don't want anybody serving if they're not called to serve. Meaning that God has called them to serve. Because then what you're doing, you're doing it out of obligation or out of religion. And what we're talking about here is, is we're talking about them forgetting that Jesus fed the 5,000. They forgot. And, and so let's look at the first part here, understanding the needs of the crowd. So in, in Mark chapter 8, verse 1, it says, In those days when, again, a great crowd had gathered and they had not, nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and having nothing to eat. So you have Jesus Christ, the, uh, the Messiah, who has compassion on who? These are the Gentiles. These are, these are the Gentiles. He's showing the disciples that, look, you're supposed to have compassion, not just on the Jewish community, but also on the Gentile community. And it goes back to our scripture in John chapter 3, verse 16. We know that, that God comes to save whosoever, right? That should be the, the thing, the door that should open for us ministry. It's simplistic, right? John 3.16 is, some, is something that we should, we should have on our hearts. But it's something that Jesus was, was He cared about the whosoever's. He cared about uh, the world. And He had compassion on the whole crowd. He didn't pick like this person out of the crowd, I have compassion on or that person. No, it was the whole crowd He had compassion on. And sometimes when we think about this, we may have a prejudice or a preconceived already judging somebody that Jesus is saying you need to have compassion on that person. That's why God put him in your life or put him or her in your life. And you go, but that person just, it's like, it's, what is it when you, when you scratch nails across the board? But you, you, you ever wonder why God put somebody that's so much like you? It's to, it's to work on the things that... And you need to have compassion on them. And sometimes God does that to show you things that you need to work on. But He had compassion on them. And He said that they have... They stayed with Him for three days, right? They hadn't eaten. One of the other things about that, when you read that, that they had, they had uh, stayed with Him for three days, it says, And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint... On the way, and some of them have, have come from far away. They were with him for three days. They were content with spiritual nourishment and being at the feet of Jesus over the physical. This is very important. This is very important because the Gentiles wanted to be with the Messiah. The religious leaders, the scribes, and the Pharisees didn't even want to be with them, right? But they wanted to. And Jesus, that's why Jesus has compassion on them. They were soaking that time in with Jesus. And that should be the same thing with us as well. It should be like, uh, well, I've got to go make time for the Lord right now. It should be, you should be soaking that time in with Christ. Being at His feet. Your spiritual nourishment is more important than your physical need. Nobody in America is hungry, hungry, Right? Because, I mean, if you think about it, if you're starving, you have the divine food pantry. Right? You can get free food. There goes my train. We have a food bank on December 6th down the street. So in America, you can get food. And, and honestly, with our diets, I don't think I, man, I don't go hungry. 
I don't I don't remember that what that's like. I can even remember as a kid not having anything as as a kid and we still had peanut butter and jelly. Right? We still had food. So for us, I mean, we need to remember our spiritual nourishment is more important. That time with Christ is so important. And it says in verse 4, And his disciples answered him, How can one feed the people, the people with bread here in this desolate place? So real quick, so we can, we can talk about it. So feeding the 5,000, the story that's earlier that we went over, uh, a few chapters ago in the book of Mark. And feeding the 5,000, remember that audience was primarily Jewish. This audience is primarily what? Gentile. Uh, the 5,000 uh, was in Galilee. They, it was in the Jewish community that they fed them. It was five loaves and two fish. It was 12 baskets. And the crowd was only with them one day. One day. And it happened during the springtime. And what did they remember what they tried to do? They tried to make him king. They wanted to make him king at that moment and Jesus had to go. The 4,000 that he's feeding now, that's, they're primarily Gentiles. It's happening in Decapolis, in the Decapolis area. is seven loaves. And it doesn't tell us the number of fish. It just says what? A few fish. A few fish. Seven baskets. Different word used for basket here in the Greek. It actually means hampers. Just think of it as a laundry hamper. Right about so big. And, and so they, they had seven baskets of, of, of hampers full of bread when they were done. The, the baskets that were used in the feeding of the 5,000 were more like lunch boxes. Those are those kind of baskets. The crowd stayed with him for three days when he fed the 4,000. And it was during the hottest part. It was summer season. Right? And they didn't try to make him king. They just wanted to spend time with him. So he couldn't send them away. Because he says what? They're going to faint. They, they, they need to eat. And so for us, the thing to remember is like we, we have Jesus and, and the, 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 we have the Messiah with us. And they were missing the fact, well, I don't know how we're going to feed all these people in this desolate place. They already did this. They watched Jesus do this before. And see how quickly their spiritual muscle memory gone. They forgot. They have the Messiah with them. They've seen him do miracle after miracle after miracle. And, and all they need to do is say, Jesus, you, well, what do you want us to do? We have seven loaves. Right? But they're, they're, what happens is they start... They start looking at the problem and they're overwhelmed by the problem instead of looking at the Messiah. And that's how we are too at times. We, we have a tendency to, to, to look at our problems and think that our problems are the biggest things that ever happened in this world. And we serve a God that's bigger than those. And we need to remember that. In verse 4 it says, And His disciples answered Him, How can one feed these people in the with bread here in this desolate place. And, and, and so for them, they were saying it's impossible. It's impossible to feed 4,000. It's impossible. They're forgetting that Jesus not only has compassion on the crowd, but He also is in, in control still. And they forgot that. They hadn't learned. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. A couple things that we need to remember when we're going through trials or suffering you need to trust God you need to trust God you need to trust God's promises how do you trust God's promises if you're not in God's word that's why you can go back to John 3 16 and say you know what he loves the world he loves me he gave his son so I could have salvation this this is not the end of it so you need to trust God trust his promises you need to give God all. And what I mean by that is turning all of that stuff over to the Lord. Because sometimes we in our human thinking think that we're supposed to fix the problem. Like, did you go to Him in prayer? Did you seek Him in His Word? You know, there, there may be a word of knowledge that comes from somebody in the church and says, you know what, maybe you should, you should pray about this. And it just takes you in a different direction. 
Yeah, the last thing you have to do, you trust Him, you trust His promises, you give God your all, you need to be obedient to Him. When you're going through trials and you're going through suffering, man, obedience and, and just... That's why you have those promises. Have those verses on your head. You know what? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still the Christ that is with me today, no matter what I'm going through. He loves me. You know, you need to have those verses in your heart, ready to go when trials and suffering come. It says in verse 5, and he, and he asked them, how many loaves do, do you have? They said seven. Verse 6, and he, he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave, uh, gave them to his disciples to set before the people. Now that word gave actually means to continually give. That's what it means, to continually give. He continually gave and passed out uh, the, the, the bread. And, and they set before him the, the crowd, and they had a few small fish. So we don't get a number of the fish, it just says a few small fish. And having blessing them, he said that these also should be set before them. You know, we were talking about Thanksgiving this week, and one of the things that, that we see is that he gives thanks. When's the last time you gave, gave God thanks for, for the provisions that you have? I mean, just seriously. I, one of the things, like when we go to dinner, one of the things I love is like, let's pray. Usually what we do is everybody puts their thumbs up. Like if we're in a big crowd, everybody puts their thumbs up. So if you see this happen on the table, so you know. If you're ever with a big crowd and we're together and everybody starts doing this, Marissa knows because we've been through it. Thumbs go up. The last person with the thumbs up, that you're praying for, for, for the meal. <laughs> and so it's, it's, and also it's a great chance for everybody to get a chance to pray and all. But at the end of the day, we need to remember that, that we need to be praying and giving thanks for the provisions that God has provided us. It's so easy to just take things for granted, right? It really is. And, and that's, that's too, I, I can tell you there are times that I forget. I'm sitting at the, at the table and then one of the things we're trying to do right now is teach our grandkids how to pray uh, with their meals. Right? Oh, that's fun. Because if one of them's talking, one's doing like this, and they're like, I'm like, okay, is this, is this, a, is this a, a foreshadowing of what's going to happen down the road <laughs> spiritually? But it's like we're trying, and, and it's difficult, but we do it because it's like we want them to give thanks to God that, that God's provided, right? Verse 8, it says, And they ate and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. No one leaves the Lord's table hungry, right? Everybody's satisfied. And so again, that word hamper, that's the same word that's used. Remember when they take Paul out of the city in Acts chapter 9, verse 25? It says, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through the opening in the wall, lowering him in the basket in Acts chapter 9, verse 25. It's the same basket. So they had seven baskets full of bread that big. There are hampers. They, they could fit a human being in there. So that's a lot of bread, right? Remember that because that's going to be an important point when we get to the disciples. And in verse 9 it says, and they were about 4,000 people and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanuth. Um, I will never get that right. Dalmanutha, thank you. And the uh, and, and, and what's crazy is I have my phonetic and I didn't come close to it. I've read it four times. Uh, the, <laughs> and now they're heading back to the area of Galilee, back into the Jewish community. Okay? And, and so what we see now is we're going to see the religious as they come back into the, uh, uh, into the Jewish community. Now the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, are actually going to be waiting on them. Uh, and, and so we, we see that Jesus had an understanding uh, and, and cared for the crowd and had compassion on them. But now the religious leaders will see an understanding as they challenge the religious uh, and so verse 11 says the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Now that word test him is actually a very important word. That means to tempt. It's the same word that's used in Mark chapter 1 verse 13 when he says, and he, and he, was, 
in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. So we have the religious leaders tempting Jesus the same way Satan tempted Jesus. And it's, it's, it's sad because it's, it's heresy. And it's hypocrisy at, at work. And we get a little more information as we said. Remember I said this is in Matthew and Mark. In Matthew chapter 16, go to verse 1 there. In Matthew 16, verse 1, and we'll kind of cover verses 1 through 4 because it's the same story. And we get a little more information here. It says, And the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Now, these two groups of people would never agree on anything, ever. So this is no different than the Republicans and the Democrats, and they come together for one purpose. If that happens, you better be scared. Right? That's the same thing. The, the scribes and, the, and the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, same thing. They always, there was division among them always. But they wanted Jesus dead. They wanted Jesus to be exposed as a false prophet, and yet they're the ones being exposed. We know this in Acts chapter 23, verse 7. It says, And when he had said, this a, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the assembly was divided. So Paul's speaking to them and as soon as Paul got, starts speaking, they start fighting. So it kind of shows you where they're at. And so that for them to come together against Jesus is it's an important piece. Let's go ahead and continue in verse 2. It says, And he answered them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. So Jesus is going to use something very common, the weather, right? We can tell when, I mean, Texas is hard to tell when they're, I mean, you have cloudy days for weeks sometimes, it seems like. Uh, and I know we're supposed to get rain today, right? But um, there's usually evidence when a storm is coming. You know it's coming. You can see the dark clouds. You can see the lightning. You can smell the rain. Right? And so that's what he's getting at. He's like, you can conclude that there's evidence of who I am. It's, it's been presented already. And the, and, and the Messiah is here, and you're absolutely missing it. You're missing it. John chapter 12, verse 37 says, Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. You realize that that signs could happen around you and you still would not, some, some people just won't believe. You know? And, and so just think about what has happened just that the Jews have witnessed. They, they've seen him heal the sick, right? But not just the sick, they saw him heal the leper. And that only happened a few times in the Bible. He raised the dead. He delivered people from bondage, from demon possession. He walked on water. He calmed the storms. He fed two multitudes twice. One of 5,000, one of 4,000. And, and, and he, it says that he opened the Word of God and, and preached it clearly, plainly, for everyone to understand. And they still didn't believe him. And we learned last week in Mark chapter 7, verse 37, one of my favorite verses. He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. And we saw that he had fulfilled that prophecy from 700 years earlier. And yet they didn't believe. What other sign do you want? You're not going to believe it. And that's the sad part about it. In Matthew 16, 4, it says, Evil and adulterous generation seeks for sign, but no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. So why would he say the sign of Jonah? Very important. Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three, three days and three nights. So Jonah is a sign of, of the Hebrew people that pointed to the Christ. It, it pointed to the Christ. And, and they were... Hypocrites that were missing the sign of the times. The Son of Man would be in the earth for three days, 
Right? And Jonah would be in the belly of the, the fish. The belly of the fish for, for three days. I'm sure it's okay. It's alright, Court. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. We'll get it after. It's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get it afterwards. Thank you. So what it speaks on is talking about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is what he's referring to. And so he, one of the things that goes back as we go back in the book of Mark in, in chapter uh, 8 and verse 12, it says, And he sighed deeply in his spirit. And he said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Now, one of the things that we remember in last week's scripture, he sighed. And, and he said the words, be open, remember? He said in Aramaic. And, and, and this thing, he's drawing a sigh from the bottom of his, his breast, and it's, it's a groan. Because they're spiritually deaf, they're spiritually blind. The religious leaders are missing it altogether. And not only missing it, but they're tempting Jesus the same way Satan did. So he sighed deeply in his spirit. And so when he asked that question, what does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. It's a simple question. The fact is, is it is a rebuke to them, right? To the religious leaders because they were missing it and they were, they were not just missing it, but they were leading other people astray. It was false teachings that they were causing people to, to fall away. They were causing people to miss the generations. There has been signs and wonders always. There are signs and wonders going on now. It's called creation. Right? In Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, it says, and, and this is just to talk about wicked generations. Uh, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, uh, in the earth, and that, that every intention of his thoughts, of his hearts, was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on, this, on, on the earth, and it grieved him to, the heart, to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man, whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creepy things and the birds of, of the heavens. For I am sorry that I have made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And Gen Genesis chapter 7 verse 1 says, And the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, and your whole, you and, your, and all your household, for I have seen that... You are righteous before me in this generation. Now, we know that the Israelites, same thing. They struggled with, with being a wretched, uh, wicked generation in the wilderness. In Psalm, 40, uh, Psalm 95, verses 10 and 11, it says, For, the, uh, for 40 years I've loathed that generation and said that they are people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore... In my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. So how many times do you think about this? They, they saw they, the seas part, the Red Sea part. They saw the, the plagues. I mean, they saw everything. All signs. How many signs did it take for you? Because I know I ran through a lot of them. I ran a lot of red lights. I know God was trying to get a hold of me because I look back at my life now and I go, I can tell you that then and then and then and I just ran through the signs. And we have people in our lives today that are like this, that are struggling, running through the signs of, of, of Jesus is trying to show them who He is and trying to get their attention, but they're missing it. And, and one of the things that's very important for us as Christians is very important. You can't be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Do not be a false witness for Christ. We, we, I think one of the biggest things that hurt us is that you think about people like Benny Hinn and, and the sensationalism and the stuff that they preach. You know, and, and they use, I was watching, my wife was watching something on um, Going Clear. It's, it's, it's the, the demonic Scientology. And the stuff that they're teaching these people. False witnesses. 
Jehovah Witnesses, same thing. False witnesses. They use Jesus, but they don't believe Jesus is a Messiah. But the, the worst part of it is, is when you got people that are like Benny Hinn and they're using that and they're they're they use it as sensationalism and it it just pushes people away from Christ. Now you can go, well, I'm not Benny Hinn. I hope you're not. Right? I hope you're not. But you, you have to understand too, you're, you're a witness for Christ too. And what kind of witness are you? That's something to, for us to remember, right? Mark chapter 13, verses 21 through 23 says, and, and, and then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, here is, uh, look, there he is, do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders and to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard, and I have told you all things beforehand. There are many people that are not as sensational as Benny Hinn that are pastors that are leading people astray. Big movements and leading people astray. You, you need to know who Jesus is. This is, why, like I, this is why we're talking about this. It's because it's important. But the thing that we need to remember is that the display of creation is a sign that happens every day that any of us can see and know that there's a God. It tells us in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there, are there words whose voice is not heard. The voice goes out through all, of, all the earth, and their words to the end of the, earth, end of the world. Uh, in them has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. And like a strong man runs its course with joy, it's rising uh, from the end of the heavens and the circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. You think about it, if that sun is off just a little bit, we freeze to death. If that sun is off just a little bit, we burn up. It's set perfectly right. If you're struggling with believing or you know somebody that goes, well, I don't know if there's a God, have them, have them turn off. Go, if you live out here, you can do it. You can, you can just sit outside and look at the sky. The Texas sky. Because there ain't no trees blocking your view like there was in Georgia for us. You couldn't see nothing. You had all these trees everywhere. But you go out to Lookout Mountain in Georgia where you can see Tennessee, Alabama, all those different states. You go out to the ocean of Hawaii, you know there's a Creator. You know there's a creator. We were out at, at Camp Buckner and looking at uh, Marble Falls and Colorado River and it's just like it, it just, you know that there's, there's signs are happening all the time. They're happening all the time. And, and, and you know, it's at the end of the day, we need to remember that. We need to remember that. You have a creator and that creator has created a creation that shows this sign daily, daily. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man, who by unrighteousness suppress the truth, and for what can be known about God is plain to them, uh, because God has shown it to them. For He is invisible attributes, namely the internal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. There's no excuse. There's no excuse. So we need to remember that. It's like at the end of the day, what other sign do you need? What other sign do you need? I mean, honestly, let's be, let's be real here. I had signs that were given to me and I, I ran right through them. It's a heart change. That's when God's Word just peels back all that stuff and, and, and the Holy Spirit moves you to a relationship with Christ. That's what we need. And so, yeah, we have a generation that, that needs Christ right now. And that's one of the things that I, I pray that, you know, that we can continue to do. Um, 
you know, just seeing the, the work that's being done, we got to see with Ryan Reese and them. And, you know, Matt flies home today. He's been with them all week. They went to a teen rescue. Two of the girls had been trafficked. Two. Teenagers. The, two of them, out of the seven, those two gave their life to the Lord as well. And got baptized in the pond that they had behind the, the place. And, and, and it's everywhere they've gone, it's just been this movement that's happening. And I keep thinking, me and Ryan were talking Thursday or Friday, he called me. I think it was Friday. And we were talking, and he goes, Mike, I, don't, I know Jesus is coming. But I, I, I think it's going to be later on. And I say, yes, because there's a whole generation of kids that don't know God. That don't know God, and God doesn't want to leave them behind. Now, yes, are we getting very close to His second coming? Yes. But we have a, a, a generation that needs Christ. They need Him. It says in verse 13, and it says, And He left them and got into the boat again, and He went to the other side. Very important, the word that He used for where, where it says He left them, <laughs> that word in the Greek means to depart as a husband divorcing a wife. So that tells you what Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, he left them. And that's what that word means. It means to depart as a husband, divorce, and a wife. And so today is our day of salvation. We need to remember that. It's, it's, it's so easy to think that oh, I, if, I, if God will just show me a sign, God will show you a sign and you'll run right through it. You've got to get real with, you, with your relationship with the Lord. Last part here, understanding it wasn't about bread in verses 14 through 21. Uh, it says, Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they uh, had only one loaf with them in the boat. So, just wrap your heads around this for two seconds. They just had this huge theological discussion about signs of the times, and right? With the Pharisees and, and, and the Sadducees, and what happens... Hey man, we ain't got but one loaf of bread. That's not enough to feed us. Where are the seven baskets at? Forgot them. Right? But that's, that's the disciples. Right? That's the disciples. They were, they were more focused on their physical needs than their spiritual. Than their spiritual. It says in, in, uh, in verse 14, it says, Now they had forgotten to bring the bread, and they had, they had only one loaf with them in the boat. Verse 15, And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And so what he's saying is that leaven is a symbol of evil in the Bible. Okay? It's that it's, it, it, it gets in the yeast and it expands and, and it just causes all kinds of problems. Uh, it's also one of the things that Jesus says in Luke chapter 1, uh, 12 verse 1, it says, In the meantime, when he... When so many, uh, so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to the disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. They were hypocrites. And that leaven, it gets in there and that, it, 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 it permeates that batch of dough. And once it does, it's, it's, you can't stop it. It's wicked. It's, it's, it's uh it's just turned it into a bad influence. And that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing at this time with the people. They were playing the part of being religious. And let me tell you, I've met a lot of people that do that. They play the part of being religious. And as soon as life hits them, man, when they get squeezed, you see it come out. And, and sadly, it's like, it's, it's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. The, the biggest thing that hurts the church today, hypocrisy. It is. It's not that we, we, we don't know the Word. Most people know the Word that are in the church. They have some foundation of it. It's the hypocrisy. It's how they live their life. They don't apply the Word in their life. It's very important for us to remember that. In 1 Corinthians 5.8, it says, Let us there, therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but the unleavened bread, the sincerity and truth. So he's saying, put away the malice and evil, and it is the contrast of truth. Truth. To live your life by truth. 
And then Matthew 23, verse 15, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, hypocrites, for you travel across the sea and the land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. That's Jesus talking. But he's like, they're, they're just going to believe the false teachings that you've told them. You're hypocrites. They were hindering people's salvation. And that's something we can't become. A hindrance to somebody else coming to know Christ. Because they're like, I don't want to be like that guy. Well, he's a Christian. No, he's not. No, he's not. He's not. It's sad when you see it happen. Verse 16 says, And they begin discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. So they go back to the bread again. So if they didn't get it right the first time, they go back again and they start talking about the bread. He just tells them something very important. I feel like this is Joe when he was talking to us at church sometimes because he'd be like, this is important and we're over here talking about something else. Like uh, turkey bowl. You know, because we do a Thanksgiving turkey bowl every year. We play five football. And we'd be so into that, but we wouldn't be focused on the spiritual things that needed to be talked about. And, and that's how, how we get sometimes. But they went right back to the discussion of bread. And it had nothing to do with bread. Their, their focus was on the world. The disciples. Their focus was on the world. Verse 17 says, And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? There's the first one. Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? In Matthew 16, verse 8, it says, But Jesus, aware of, the, of this, said, O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourself the fact that you have no bread? He calls them out and tells them, You have little faith. Your focus is on the bread and not on any of the stuff that's happened in the last day or so. The feeding of the 4,000, the feeding of the Gentiles, the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees who, have, who just tempted him the way that Satan did. The warning, because he says, beware, beware. They didn't pick the warning up. They missed it because they were focused on bread and, and we can be the same way right God is trying to get at you and talk to you he's done sent scripture and, and it's, you keep getting the same scripture over and over and over and over and somebody gives you a word and it's the same scripture and you're focused on your phone or your football I was watching something I don't know what the guy I was like it's bad Bad decision 101. Not a good start to the marriage. Because the, the wife wanted to get married in December. He goes, oh, we can't get married then because of football. And I was like, this is not going to end well. <laughs> right? This is not a good start. That's her day. Can't do it on that day because we may be in the playoffs. And I was like, not that team, dude. Y'all are not that good. But I was like, not a good start to the marriage, right? But it's like, that's how we can be. See, what Jesus is trying to do is He's trying to put the, the, the picture together for them to see the whole picture. But all they keep seeing is the puzzle pieces. That's all they keep seeing. They're arguing over one loaf of bread. Man, I need to eat, bro. How much are you going to get? And yet they had the bread of life with them. In the, with them. In John 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Their minds were dull, their hearts were, were hard, their eyes were blind, and their ears were deaf. That's why he tells them, because remember, this happened again earlier when he fed the 5,000 back in March 6, 52. He said, for they did not understand about the lows, but their hearts were hardened. Their hearts are still hardened. 
They had seen the power of God move and, and they were missing the, the spiritual significance of the situation. And it's sad because we can do the same thing. In verse 18 it says, having, having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? He's, he's trying to say, hey look, remember you saw this? You heard this? Do you not remember this? And, and that's the same thing for you too. Like when you're going through a trial, you're going through something serious in your life, and you're in that valley, that man... Remember your eyes? Do you not see? Have you not heard? Do you not remember what's in my word? The promises that I have for you? I love that he uses the ears and the eyes. Right? And our memory. That's why God's promises should be on our heart. Ezekiel 12 verse 2 says, Son of man, you will dwell in the midst of the rebellious house who have eyes to see, but see not. Who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. That's what happens when you have a hard heart. That's what happens when your heart starts getting hard and you start having hard hearing. And then Jesus quotes Isaiah in Mark chapter 4, verse 12. He says, So they may indeed see, but not perceive. And may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And that's why it tells us in Scripture that we're actually supposed to, uh, you know, it talks about us as we, as we share Scripture with our children, and we're supposed to, it shall be on the front list between your eyes. Right? And that's why it says in Deuteronomy 11, verse 18, it says, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart, in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hands, and they shall be frontless between your eyes. And this is the most important part. You shall teach them to your children, talking to them when you are sitting in your house, and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall write them on your doorpost. So you've got to see them, right? Of the house, on your gates, that, uh, that your days and their days and your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to the, your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. We're supposed to be in the Word. And, and one of the things that we do when we're in the Word is we're reading the Word. Maybe we listen to the Word, right? It's like, do you remember what you heard, what you read? Remember who I am. I'm Jesus, the Messiah. And it says in verse 19, it says, When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces do you, uh, did you uh, take up? Then he said 12. And then the seven uh, for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to him, do you not yet understand? So he, he this is the beauty of Jesus. Right? He jars their memory. <laughs> and sometimes he has to do that with us too. Right? He jars their memory. He asks them questions that they should be able to answer. Right? And, and they're able to answer the questions. And that's why he finishes off, do you not yet understand? He's like, get the context of what we're talking about here. It's so much more than bread. It's so much more than bread. And that's the same thing for us. It's like, it, this was an amazing miracle that we see that, that not just one, but two feeding miracles that Jesus did. And it's again, it's that, that spiritual <coughs> memory. Muscle memory. Being in His Word. Hey, Jesus did this before. I remember reading this. We just went over this not probably a month ago. It's, it's, it's not a, a repetition of religion. It's a repetition of relationship of where you spend time in God's Word. You spend time in prayer. You spend time with Him. And you remember the amazing things that the Lord is doing. And that He's showing up all the time. Even in creation, God is showing up. Even in creation. And yet, we, we miss it. And I know that we probably have people that we have that are running through signs right now. Well, if God would just do this, I would, I would believe. 
or if God would show me this, I would believe. God's been trying to reach you already. He's been knocking at the door of your heart. Be careful. Do not be hypocrites the way the Pharisees and the Sadducees were. Now, I'm not saying your life is perfect. We're, we're in pursuit of holiness. We're in pursuit of righteousness. You're like a child, right? Some of us new Christians, we get up, we walk, we fall just like a baby. And what does the mom and dad do? They help them up and walk. And guess what? As a teenager, what do you do? This ain't mine. This is Ryan. I heard Ryan share this. Because he skates. So he used to skateboard. He goes, what do you do when they were teenage as a skateboard? They always fall. And what does the parent do? The parent goes up and helps them up. That's the same thing Jesus does with us. And, and we have enough grace for the journey and just something to remember. Like, people are watching your life because they you say you're a Christian. You say that you're a follower of Christ. And they're watching you. Because they want to see if it's real. And God will use you as a walking, talking billboard for Jesus Christ. But you can also be used as a Pharisees or Sadducees as a hypocrite. Okay? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for today's word. We do pray as we uh, dove into today's scripture. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that, uh, that Jesus is has compassion on each of us that cares for each one of us and and uh, I pray Lord uh, as we get ready to enjoy this this coming week that uh, sometimes Thanksgiving is not a great time if, if there's family struggles or uh, I can remember when growing up as a kid it was always a, a stressful time because of coming from a divorced family and and Mom and dad were always fighting which grandparent we were going to, and it just was a mess. And so, Lord, I pray that if uh, anybody's dealing with any of that, Lord, that you would calm their hearts, help them through this, and, and that they would just have a wonderful uh, time with family. Uh, we pray also for those that are traveling and those that are coming home or those that are uh, going to be traveling and coming back home and, and be back Sunday. We just pray for their travel. Uh, we, we thank you so much for all that you're doing in this church. We do pray. Uh, again, I lift up my wife and just her health, and I pray for anyone else who may be sick uh, that may be dealing with that, that cold that's going around. I pray that you would uh, uh, be with them and heal them, Lord, and, uh, and we thank you so much just for today. I pray that uh, each of us would have just a blessed week. And uh, as we think about the application uh, through this scripture this week, I just pray that we could live a life that would be uh, an example of Christ uh, for those that are around us, Lord. And I pray, I, I know that we all have family members. Sometimes the only time we see them is during Thanksgiving. I pray that, that there's an opportunity for us to share the gospel that we would do it. If the, if the conversation comes up, let's go for it. And so I just lift that up to you, Lord. I thank you and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.